I'm excited to introduce and welcome Dr. Sarah Beach from the University of Michigan. Dr. Veach did her doctorate training in physics at the University of Washington in the laboratory of Sarah Keller. She went on to do postdoctoral trainings uh, at the University of British Columbia and Robert Hancock's lab, and subsequently at Cornell and Barbara Baird's lab. In 2010, she joined the University of Michigan, where she is now associate professor and associate director of the biophysics department. Dr. Beach's research focuses on phase separation, particularly within lipid membranes, how cells tune membrane composition to achieve this phase separation, and how this phase separation contributes to protein function, uh, organization and function, particularly focus on immune receptor signaling. She has received numerous awards for her research and works such as the NSF Career Award, the Henry Russell Award, and many others. We are excited to hear about your exciting work, and please welcome Dr. Sarah Beach. Wow, it is really wonderful to be here. Um, it, listening to the talks already have put me out of my comfort zone. And so it's my, my opportunity now to put you guys out of your comfort zone. <laughs> so please, please make this interactive as much as, uh, as is reasonable. Um, I would love to, love to clarify anything that doesn't make sense. Okay. So, right, so I study, I'm very, I've, for my whole career, I've been interested in, in thinking about phase separation at membranes. And here's an example of a phase separated giant unilamellar vesicle. So this is purely synthetic, made of lipids that we ordered from a company, mix them together. They, they uh, organize into this nice spherical vesicle and the, the structure you're seeing here is on the surface of this sphere. Um, and so this is a beautiful example of phase separation in this two dimensional system. Um, but really what drives the driving questions is, is, is this relevant to biology? Um, if so, how? And so what my lab has been mostly focused on in the last 10 years, which is terrifyingly long, um, is, is bringing this to the cellular context. And, and to do that, we've done a, a, one of our primary methods has been kind of single molecule super resolution imaging. Um, and this is an example of a, a picture that we could re reconstruct. Okay, so I had an outstanding introduction, and so I can just talk about this very quickly. Okay, so there's all the rage right now in cell biology is this idea of, of, of liquid droplets in the cytoplasm and the nucleus of cells. Um, and these are really cool and it's very exciting. Um, and I just wanna draw some contrast to what I'm gonna talk about today um, uh, in comparison to this. Um, and the biggest thing, or one, one large thing is that um, they're biologically tuned very differently. Okay, so all of the beautiful pictures we've seen so far are these really uh, highly concentrated regions of proteins um, and, and typically RNA um, that are really high contrast. And they pass through the phase boundary through a very, very variety of different means. Um, but in this, this position that, that's much, that's kind of over here in this phase diagram that we already saw, which was awesome. Okay, so membranes are biologically tuned very differently. Um, they aren't actually in this two-phase region of the phase diagram really ever. Um, in fact, they seem to sit at a temperature above the phase transition temperature, um, but also in a different part of the diagram. So if you do force a membrane, and this is a, a, an example of a vesicle that's been isolated from the plasma membrane of a cell, um, so it's a vesicle, not a cell, but, but it contains plasma membrane components. Um, if you look at it as it passes through its phase transition, it does it in a very different way than the pictures we've seen so far. Um, it does it in a kind of very dynamic fluctuating way. Um, and temperatures being kind of lowered slowly throughout this movie. Um, and you can kind of see these fluctuations grow and, and become larger until it's really at some point, it's obvious that there's two phases just here. Um, so it's still going, this vesicle can pass from a single phase system uh, to a, two phases, but it happens in a different way. And it happens in a different way because it's, it's tuned to a very different part of the phase diagram. Um, and this part of the phase diagram is fun for physicists like people like train like me, because there's all sorts of beautiful physics that happens here. And one of the, the types of beautiful physics that happens here is you end up with these really exciting fluctuations that can be very large compared to single molecules that make them up. Um, and so there's all sorts of structure even in this single phase system. Okay, so I, if you've been paying attention to the membrane world, there's been this kind of 30 years of interest in this area of called, oftenly called lipid rafts. 
um, where this idea that phase separation underlies structure in the plasma membrane has been around for a long time, but it's never really had the foothold that this cell biology, uh, this cytoplasmic and nuclear phase separation has had um, because the experiments are much, much less obvious, okay? And in fact, there's a ton of data out there showing showing evidence for really small scale dynamic structure in cells, um, but very little of the beautiful pictures like we've seen already today. Um, and this makes sense in this context, these cells are not two phase. There aren't these big obvious phases. It's actually in a single phase. Um, and what we think is that this structure that people have reported before is are these fluctuations that are associated with this interesting biological tuning. Um, the other thing that I think being near this point in the phase diagram does for a cell potentially is that it, it's kind of at a place where it wants to organize. Um, there's, there's a kind of a nearby phase transition. Um, all, the, all the pieces that you need to make something happen are there. Um, now it can just um, take advantage of other prop properties to make that happen. And so that's the, the argument that I'm gonna make for you today. Hopefully you'll come away thinking that I might not be crazy. Um, and so here's my roadmap. Um, I'm going to start off talking about very simple model membranes um, and introduce this idea of a scaffolded domain. Um, hopefully, I'll convince you that um, we see very similar types of structures in cells, um, and we think, uh, and, and we can we can start to think about how these can be functional um, and design experiments to, to answer those types of questions. Um, I'm going to uh, short, tell a short story that's more recent that talks about kind of how the cool phase separations that we've already heard about today might interact with this membrane phase separation to do even, even new things. Um, and if I have time at the end, I will talk about um, actin or other types of ways that things can be scaffolded to have different types of, of, of resulting functions. Okay, so starting simple. Um, we start off with just, a, again, back at our vesicles. Um, we can do experiments where we label a variety of things in, in, our, in our systems. And in this case, uh, I think these are just labeled with a fluorescent probe um, called DIIC12. It's just a, it's a lipid that has a fluorophore on it. And we can look at our vesicles when they're phase separated. And when they're phase separated, we can get these, these domains, this probe to condense into these higher concentration regions, these phase separated regions. Um, but if we look at it at a different temperature, a different set of conditions, we can make those things, uh, those domains disperse, and it looks like there's no more interactions. Everything is nice and uniform. So this is just typical normal phase separation. Um, another thing that we can do is instead of just looking at a free-floating vesicle, we can look at a vesicle. In this case, it's, it's adhered to another membrane through components in the vesicle itself. Um, and, and basically, this is we simply use this adhesion as a trick to gather a subset of components at this adhesion zone um, so that we increase their local concentration. So this we're using, uh, it could be, it's a biotinylated lipid or biotinylated lipid binding protein. Okay, again, if we look at one of these vesicles at a low temperature where it would be phase separated anyways, you see phase separation and it looks pretty much the same as before. But now if we look at these vesicles at a temperature where the free floating vesicle would be completely uniform, um, we can see kind of the hints that this domain still exists. Um, so this is what I'm, I'm going to refer to as a, a templated or a, a, a scaffolded domain. And it's there because we've increased the local concentration of, in this case, I think it's a cholera toxin um, binding to a lipid. Um, and this thing that we've clustered has a, has a preference for one of these phases. Um, and because the membrane is, is near one of these phase transitions, there's some kind of memory that, that, that exists. And so it, it templates a domain that looks a lot like a phase. Okay, so once we have this system, um, we, can, we can tune it in a couple different ways. Um, one thing we can do is change the stimulus. And in this case, I'm saying the stimulus is the things that we've clustered into this domain. And so we could cluster a component that likes our break phase and make a break domain. Or we could, in this example that I showed you already, cluster something that likes our dark phase and make a dark domain. So this is the external perturbation. I'm, I'm just changing that, yeah. Should we assume that the radius is uh, large enough that there's not going to be effects of crowding in local paths? Uh, uh, so first, yeah, yes, yes, we can. Um, this is, is all macroscopic. So these are like 100 microns across or something. So they're much, much bigger than the individual molecules. The adhesion itself could very well be doing something interesting. Um, when we make these vesicles with boring lipid compositions that don't phase separate on their own, we don't see these types of structures. Yeah. Um, 
The other thing we can do actually to tune the contrast of these domains is to change thermodynamic parameters in the mem membrane itself, right? So I can make a, a vesicle from a membrane that never phase separates and I wouldn't see this domain. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm turning up temperature and you can see the contrast of the domain um, decreasing. Um, but you could also change membrane composition and it, it would have a similar effect. Okay, so, so these scaffold do domains kind of take in information about what has been clustered and also what's the thermo thermodynamic state of the membrane to, to, to kind of figure out what the contrast should be of, these, of, this, of this lipid probe. Um, here's another example that I love from the literature. So in, that, in the first example, I said we clustered a component at the bottom and that's what gave us this contrast, but we can do a similar thing by pulling a tether. And this is not my work. This is from Patricia Bassenrose's lab. Um, and what they did is they took a vesicle that was near a phase transition and pulled, pulled the tether and then looked at the, the, the um, sorting of components into this tether. Uh, and they found that when there was a phase transition nearby, you could see differential sorting of certain components into the tether. Um, but when, when you were far from this phase transition, you didn't see this differential sort. Um, this paper also has a nice example of they, they, then if they could put a protein on this as well, that also like sorting, you could further enhance the kind of lipid sorting that, that occurred. Um, so it need not be this, this stimulus need not be a, you know, clustering of a component. It could be some other physical perturbation. It's something happening outside that then the system is responding to. Okay, so it's fun to play with model membranes. They, they have physics that we actually really understand very nicely um, and, and they do what we want them to do. But what we really care about is what's going on in, in cells. And if these, this kind of formalism that we think about actually applies in this context. Okay, so we did a very similar experiment. Um, in this case, we took uh, one of our favorite probes, which is called cholera toxin, and we just formed massive aggregates of this, this probe on, on the membranes of, and these are uh, B cells, type of immune cell. Um, and, and not surprisingly, you form giant clusters of cholera toxin. Um, and it's a nice assay because it's very easy. You just throw on antibodies or streptavidin or something like that. Um, but the problem is that you end up with all these tiny puncta um, and these tiny puncta, it's hard to then do quantitative imaging to understand concentration. And so what we do is we use, um, we use super resolution imaging um, in order to really start quantifying these types of the concentrations in these domains. And so this is a cartoon of what our experiment looks like. Um, we see lots, we always image two things at the same time. So we are imaging one thing, in this case, it would be cholera toxin that is clustered. Um, and another thing that is our probe molecule that we're wanting to lo measure local concentration. Um, this is an example in a live cell. So these probes are all moving around. Um, and what we do is we localize these sparsely distributed components using single molecule fitting, um, using standard methods. Um, and one thing you can do at this point is you could just take all those localizations you get at the end of the day and reconstruct an image. Um, and so this is an image representing the average um, position of, of these molecules that we're imaging in this. And this is, this is about 10 minutes of data. So it's, it's, it's a, an average over a long time. Um, the, the things that we're looking at are moving, so we, we don't want to just take a big average and lose all our time resolution. So we do something else. Um, we measure pairwise distances between these spots that we've measured. Um, and we look at their statistics, basically. We look at their distributions and see how they would compare to a random distribution uh, and do lots of corrections and careful, uh, thought, caref we carefully th think about how time, um, time affects these types of measurements. Um, and boundary conditions and stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the day, what we end up with is something called a correlation function, which is this curve that I'll show in a few more uh, uh, slides after this. But basically the way you read one of these plots is that if, if this is a curve that starts curving up, that means these two things are co-enriched. Um, so they co-cluster. Um, if this curve kind of deflects downwards, that means they are, um, uh, they're depleted basically. And then you can have more complicated behaviors like something enriching on the edge of one of these clusters. Um, but I don't think I talk about any of that in this talk. Okay, so we can start off with this cholera toxin aggregate that's kind of ugly, but then we can look at the co-distribution with other proteins in the membrane. And um, uh, we're working in immune cells, so we, we look at proteins involved in immune signaling. And so, so these are these examples, the CD45 and LIN. 
And we both look at the full length proteins. So with all their interesting functional domains and also just their minimal membrane anchors. So how they're anchored to the plasma membrane without all that interesting protein interactions. Um, and what's neat in these collar toxin domains, we can see that they sort proteins. These, these curves reflect up and deflect down. Um, and the minimal anchors do the same thing that the full length proteins do. And so the minimal anchor is sufficient to describe the distribution of these proteins with respect to, to this cholera toxin clusters. So some things are enriched, right? In this case, it's lin, which is the kinase, and um, some things are depleted. In this case, it's CD45, which is, which is the phosphatase. Okay, so in immune cells and many other types of cells, there's constantly this, this kinase phosphatase balance. So things in the membrane are being phosphorylated by lin, kinase, and they're being dephosphorylated by CD45 phosphatase, and there are, other, there are others also in the membrane, um, but just these are the, as a representative too. Um, and there's constantly this fight, and this ends up with some steady state level of phosphorylation of proteins in the membrane. And the, and the one we care most about is, this, uh, is the B cell receptor. Um, so usually, right, these kinases, if they are allowed to win, then the cell will get activated. Um, and usually if the phosphatases are allowed to win, um, then they will not get activated. So uh, the key to uh, immune function in a lot of examples is shifting this balance um, so that the kinase or phosphatase wins in different circumstances. Okay, so these proteins that I told you sorted with respect to these collar toxin clusters are kinases and phosphatases. And in fact, these collar toxin domains are enriched in the kinase and depleted of the phosphatase. And so what you'd expect is that you'd see an increase um, in, in this case, tyrosine phosphorylation. These are tyrosine um, kinases and phosphatases. And that's what we see. We can, we can do a total tyrosine phosphorylation stain and show that within these clusters, we see a big uptick in tyrosine phosphorylation. And so simply by aggregating in this very artificial way, collar toxin on the surface of these cells, we've created this little hot spot for tyrosine phosphorylation in the membrane. Oh, is it gonna show? There's a movie. Try it, probably means it doesn't work. It's okay. Okay. So clustering collar toxin is not that exciting, um, but uh, when we cluster the B cell receptor, we see a very similar thing. And the B cell receptor is nice. Um, it has a whole cellular machinery uh, working to cluster it and do all sorts of other things that make this signal even more robust than we see in, our, in our, these collar toxin kind of uh, silly experiments. Um, and because of that, we can even see time resolution of these sorting of these components. And so instead of looking at the upswing and downswing of these curves, I'm just giving you that first point. And so it shows you kind of the magnitude of enrichment or depletion kind of overall. <clears throat> and so we can choose two. These are anchors from SRC family kinases with just different lipid anchoring, membrane anchoring motifs, and they sort differentially with respect to B cell receptor clusters. What we've done in this case um, is we've looked at not just a few anchors, but many, many anchors with different kinds of structural motifs. Um, and we've looked at them both in cells and in model membranes. And so we can say, how well does this protein, this membrane anchor partition in a vesicle with respect to this one of our phases, this liquid ordered phase? And then how much, how well does this anchor sort with respect to our B cell receptor clusters in cells? And we see this um, beautiful correlation. Um, and I've split this into two kind of sets of data here that I fit um, and, and they're separated by class. So these are peripheral anchors on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. Um, so they're just hanging out on one side of the membrane. Um, and then these red points are ones that are transmembrane, single pass transmembrane helices. Um, and a few things to note here is, is so, especially for these peripheral proteins, phase separation is sufficient to describe this, this structure that we see. This is, they're partitioning exactly as they do in the plasma membrane vesicles that are phase separated. Um, the other really interesting thing is that um, the, the contrast, the slope of this line is not one. So if it were one, they would sort exactly the same as they do it in cells and in vesicles. But here we're seeing a slope of about 0.4 or, or, or a half, roughly. And so this is different. So this, we need something else to explain. And I'll come back to that. Um, Okay, so in this case, instead of these collar toxin kind of artificial domains where we don't really have any signaling proteins in there, anything that can be phosphorylated, um, in these BC BCR clusters, we have B cell receptors, they can get tyrosine phosphorylated, um, and they do, 
Um, and what we can do is we can think about tuning the contrast of this domain using some of the tricks that, I, that we use in vesicles to see if we can tune the level of phosphorylation that we see. And so the, the hypothesis is that when we see, when we create a condition where we expect to have more contrast, so better sorting of, of different types of anchors, um, then we should see more tyrosine phosphorylation. And so we do the same two knobs that we did before. So one, we can change the stimulus. And we did that in this case by adding in kind of very artificial co-receptors. So these are single pass uh, transmembrane domains that we can bind and co-crosslink to our receptors, um, but they have different membrane anchoring motifs. Um, one has, is palmitylated and, and tends to like this liquid ordered phase. Um, and the other is not palmitylated and, and counteracts the desire for this uh, domain to be in this liquid ordered state. And so we can do this experiment and measure how well these are able to sort components in the membrane. Um, and as we were expecting, um, we get lower contrast when we uh, co-crosslink with something that counteracts, that, that likes the disordered phase, likes the other phase that this, this receptor cluster usually likes. Um, then we can go and look at the tyrosine phosphorylation of the B-cell receptor using specific antibodies and see that in fact, when you inhibit, when you when you, you can use these uh, co-receptors to either enhance or suppress tyrosine phosphorylation, and it goes in the direction you would expect. Interestingly, real BCR co-receptors um, also have different anchorings to the plasma membrane, and this is, has already been proposed as, as a kind of a one part of the puzzle of how these co-receptors work in, their, in regulating the activity of, of B-cell receptor activation. Okay, another knob we can turn is to fiddle with the thermodynamics of the membrane. Um, and we do this in this case by adding in another component that we, we expect to phase, uh, alter the phase transition temperature. So it's a little bit like raising temperature, but we're really, we're keeping temperature constant. Um, so these are these two, two molecules that we've characterized in the past and they have a really striking effect on these plasma membrane vesicles. Um, and we expect one of them to increase our contrast and one of them to decrease our contrast. So we can do the same experiment and look at the sorting of two kind of components and show that when we increase contrast, we, we increase the sorting of these two components. Um, and if we add the other compound, we decrease the sorting. So basically we're making less of, a, less of an obvious domain. Um, we can again look at the tyrosine phosphorylation levels of the B cell receptor and, and again have the same conclusion. Under conditions where we get higher contrast, um, we also get more tyrosine phosphorylation. Um, and, in, in, and there's lots of reasons why uh, ways that you can imagine cells might take advantage of this by changing their lipidomes, they could change potentially their sensitivity to, to, to be activated. Okay. So, right, I started with scaffolded domains and very simple vesicles. We think we see very similar behaviors in cells and have an idea of what those functions might look like. Um, the next part is to think about these beautiful phase transitions that happen in the cytoplasm and nuclei of cells. Um, and, and other groups have already tethered these things to membranes. And there are many biological examples where it makes sense to tether them to membranes. And here is one, um, my movie's not gonna play today either, but what would happen in this movie is that you'd see what looks like kind of robust phase separation in two dimensions. But in this case, it's not happening because of the lipids, it's happening because these proteins are phase separating on this lipid surface. Um, and in particular, there's a bunch of, this is a reconstituted system looking at looking like T cell receptor activation. Um, and, and there's many examples now where you, where you can, if you conjugate one of these things, one of these pathways to a membrane, you can see really robust, beautiful two-dimensional phase separation. So what we were interested in is if we put this, um, one of these protein driven phase separations in a membrane that has an interesting membrane phase transition, um, what other types of behaviors might we expect to see? And so this is work done with, with Ben Nakta, who's a assistant professor at Yale. And basically this is the setup. We have a, a, a system, it's, I, I think of it as just polymers, but polymers form these beautiful condensates like we've seen already in the cells. Uh, and then we couple that to a phase, phase separated membrane system. And this is purely um, theory to start. Um, and this is the model they set up. They, they have a nice two dimensional system membrane that can phase separate. And they also have a polymer system that can phase separate. And they're coupled by including a subset of the membrane components as molecules that can participate in this, in this polymer phase transition. 
Okay, and the main result of this study is that you get a whole re new region of the phase diagram where you get surface coexistence of this polymer phase. And it looks something like this. You have your polymer that, that under different conditions would phase separate and form one of these big drop, droplets in solution. Um, but under this condition, it only forms at, at the membrane. It's a two-dimensional object and it involves the, the, the proteins or polymers, the membrane and these tethers. Now, uh, this is something that we, 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 the word we use to describe this is called pre-wetting. And it happens in a part of the phase diagram where we would never get a, a three-dimensional big drop. Um, it happens at much lower concentrations. And it's a purely surface phenomenon, I guess. And so here's kind of what this looks like. Um, when you think about um, what, what this is a very complicated system, lots of, lots of different dimensions, lots of ways you could draw phase diagrams. And I'll just conceptualize it this way, right? We have a system that, um, that is tunable in lots of interesting ways. Um, so we can have a system that, that is in a single phase, both in the bulk and, and on the surface, and we can tune it to phase separation, both by tuning these polymer interactions, like get these polymers to want to interact more, they're gonna to wanna to condense on the membrane. Um, but because our membrane is also interesting, we can tune membrane interactions and do the same thing at fixed polymer interactions. And so we, we started to do this in our experiments and we're still getting started and there's lots of problems still, but this, I, I'm, I'm confident that this concept will hold. So we can start off with a system, um, this is a boring membrane um, with, with a, a, a droplet forming protein that, that's bound to it through his tags and nicolipids. This is a common way of doing things. And we can have many conditions where we see nothing interesting, um, but we can take the same um, boring membrane and increase protein concentration and get it to form these beautiful droplets on the, on the membrane. Um, we can do the same thing by keeping the protein concentration fixed and just changing the membrane composition. Um, we can also form these beautiful droplets. Um, this depends on the details of what membrane you choose. And so in, in particular, if you're close to the phase transitions, you can get these droplets to form at, um, at uh, lower protein concentrations. Um, this is the boring membrane that doesn't, um, have any phase transition and it's a higher threshold. And then a nice thing too, is we can take a membrane that isn't in a liquid state anymore. It's a gel, so things can't move around um, and we don't even see these droplets form. So it's important that both of these things are, are, are liquids. Okay, so membrane interactions matter um, because the membranes, sorry, the membrane can mediate interactions between these, these polymers. Um, so there's been a lot of studies showing that you know, if you put the uh, if you put say proteins in an interesting solvent like it, that has structure of its own, that that itself can mediate interactions between those proteins, even if they don't have interactions on their own. Um, and you can actually calculate the magnitude of these interactions, and, and they can be reasonable, especially when you're near one of these near one of these phase transitions. And so, um, one thing that I think is really exciting, and one area that we're trying to go, and a lot of people are trying to go, is thinking about this interplay. So, there's a lot of these droplets that are anchored to the membrane. Um, they can be, they, by forming droplets at the membrane, you, you scaffold these domains where the membranes can start having structure. Um, but you can also tune the membrane to, to control the stability of these structures. And there's like, they all talk to each other. There's lots of ways to regulate it. Okay, I think this is fast, so I'll go through it quickly, I guess. But um, I just wanted to say that I've been talking about things that involve clustering, but, but you can also have scaffolds that hold things apart. And one example is, is actin. So actin forms this meshwork under the mem plasma membrane of cells. Um, and it's this filamentous structure that kind of um, what provides structural stability, but it also interacts with the membrane. And one thing that's very interesting about this actin scaffold is simply by having a membrane attached to actin. So here's an example of one of these plasma membrane vesicles that we can isolate. Uh, it doesn't have actin um, and we can see beautiful phase separation, um, but the, the cell that it's attached to um, does have actin and there's no phase separation. Um, and so what we and a lot of other people think is that actin's doing something to disrupt this phase transition. And so um, we've looked at this theoretically. If we put one of our, our model membranes onto a kind of a fixed cortical actin looking mesh, we can disrupt this phase transition. And this is kind of a, a well-known result in, in uh, physics and we just applied to this system. Um, 
So basically, in this situation where you would have macroscopic phase separation, um, now it wets this actin filaments and disrupts that macroscopic separation. Um, and it makes it so the largest domain you would ever see is set by the scale of the actin mesh. Um, in this situation, um, it's maybe a little more harder to see, but um, this has small scale structure um, and the small scale structure tends to hang out now along this actin mesh. And so in this case, it can stabilize structure. So actin can have this kind of dual role of, of breaking things up, but also bringing things together. Um, so there's been a number of experiments that, that support this idea that these, act, these phases, if you set up the experiment right, can wet these, act, these cytoskeletal meshes um, and actin or other types of cytoskeletal. And so if we think about putting a, a signaling cascade on one of these systems, um, if the structure, these aren't gonna show either, but um, what would be showing here is that in this system where you have a really tight actin mesh, um, in our model uh, of, of tyrosine, uh, at, of kinase and phosphatase kind of competition, we end up with not a lot of activation of our receptors because we can't form any of these bigger domains. Um, whereas in this case, there's a, 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 um, a sparser actin mesh, so that allows the formation of these larger domains and we end up with, with, with more activation. And so in immune cells and B cells in particular, if, their past experiments have shown that coupling to actin to the signaling pathway is important. Um, actin, as soon as the receptors activate, actin actually gets disassembled to some extent. And this is important for kind of amplification of signaling. Um, you can just disrupt actin and, and get B cells to activate through their B cell receptor. Um, and, and there's a lot of interest in the membrane world of thinking about how actin might, coupling to actin might kind of drive systems off equilibrium to give you new types of behaviors. And, and this could totally um, fit into this picture. Okay, so my kind of big take home message is um, uh, there's been this story of lipid rafts in the literature for a long time that pictures like domains floating around in a membrane that are well, well described. Um, and what I would argue that maybe we should be thinking about instead is that the membrane is kind of this interesting solvent. It's got structure built into it. It's very responsive to stuff going on around it. Um, and it can be templated by these structures um, and contribute to the structures that form. Um, and, and a lot of um, the way that a protein might experience this interesting environment is based on how it happens to be coupled to the plasma membrane. So whether or not it has a palmitylation is gonna really uh, affect the types of interaction partners it might run into um, and, and therefore in, in influence its function. So with that, I would like to thank you. Thank my group, in particular Sarah Shelby. She um, is just uh, got up her first faculty position and will be starting hopefully very soon, which is exciting. Um, and I also, the, the, the Ben, uh, ben Macta is very responsible for this, um, the polymer and membrane coupling uh, theory and, and the experiments are being done by uh, Yusuf Bavari in my lab. Thank you very much. <laughs>